Welcome to the conversation with Dr. Nina Fedorov. Nina is a microbiologist and geneticist. She's a personal friend who has spent fair amount of time in research, development, writing books at the university, at Think Tank, and she was also advisor to Hillary Clinton. And that's when we met some time ago. I'd like to use this opportunity today to talk to her about food. Nina, welcome. Thank you. Delighted food, to be here. Thank you. Food is such an important issue. It affects all of us in every way possible. It is a complex interconnected system which connects us with water, environment, health, soil. At the same time, food really doesn't get the kind of conversation that we should really have on food. For example, in my area, which is technology, every time I speak to someone on technology, automatically they assume satellite, software, computers, mobile phones. No one really talks about technology related to agriculture. No one talks about all the exciting things going on with genetically modified food, for example. How do we change this conversation? So what I'd like to do today is really learn from you a little bit about what's happening in the food world. So let's start with a simple question like, what is the status of food in the world today? Well, thank you for the question. Um, the status of food in the world today is that we have enough to feed a reasonable diet to everyone on the face of the earth. And yet there are people who are chronically hungry. Something like 800 million of us, wow. and maybe as many who are just plain overweight. So there's a wealth of issues right in that, having said that. That is, it's about poor countries and rich countries. It's about countries where the agriculture is extremely technological and sophisticated, and countries where people are actually farming the way they farmed 300 years ago. So it's inequality, but we have enough food. We have gotten very good at producing food. However, we're 7 billion people now. And I will, if you let me, go a little bit into the history of how we got to 7 billion. Mm -hmm. but let me look forward just a moment. But the population folks are telling us that we're going to be 10 billion yep. in a matter of decades. Maybe it'll take 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. but maybe not. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it all depends on what happens in the world. Um, right now, the rate of increase in our ability to, pr to produce food is not keeping up with our numbers. And there's something else that's, that people don't give a thought to here because we assume uh, a, a diet rich in meat. Mm -hmm. But as people, as country after country, powered by some of the technology that you've introduced, uh, get out of poverty, they want a better diet. They want more meat in their diet. And meat... But is that a good thing? It is a good thing, it's a double-edged sword. You're asking me about food production. Everybody needs some protein in the diet. Um, we in America go to extremes, we eat a lot of meat. But the point that I want to make here that many people don't appreciate is that to grow a, a, a kilogram of grain takes about, let's put it in terms of water, 2,000 liters of water. To grow a kilogram of hamburger takes 20,000 
Wow. Because most of that grain, which took so much, goes into feeding the cow. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, there's a term called the feed conversion ratio. Mm -hmm. How much feed do you have to feed to get a, a pound out? Mm -hmm. And for, for the cattle that produce the hamburgers that we so love, it's about 10 to 1. Wow. So our paradox going forward is that we're getting richer and more numerous. And then, again, something that we're just beginning to grapple with, our ability to grow food is being pressured by climate change. Let me stop there and let you ask. I, I'd love to tell a little bit about how we got to seven billion. Good, good to know that. You know, I know from my experiences in India that we have huge amount of food surplus comparatively. But okay. at the same time, but at the same time, we have 200 million people hungry. hungry. It just doesn't make sense. On one hand, we have a lot of food. On the other hand, we have problem reaching out to the right number of people at the right time. So what do you see is the role of IT and telecom and software and satellite in the food industry? Oh my goodness. Um, where to begin? Let me just carve out a little piece. Um, cell phones have spread yep. so quickly yep. um, that it's mind-boggling. Um, many of us use it for entertainment and for keeping in touch with our friends, but cell phones can enable farmers who are not connected in any other way to any kind of support system which is, by the way, very important for farmers. Plants have diseases, which many people don't know. Cattle, any animals they have, have diseases. Getting help for any of that, or even instruction in how to farm more efficiently, can be done all now by cell phones. That's spreading. It isn't universal. But I will tell you that farmers are very canny people. And they're already using cell phones to figure out where they're going to get the best price for what they have if they have access to the markets. That's just one. What but about satellites? What about, you know, satellite imagery? You know, all of that for agriculture ought to be very important. Satellite, yeah, remote sensing is um, a technology that has promised a great deal for agriculture for a long time and hasn't delivered, but I think it's beginning to get there. Mm -hmm. And you can see that companies like Monsanto see it as important, witness their purchase of a, a company that was using such data for... Um, data for, mining. For, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, exactly what, how that will, will impact agriculture is, is really in, in um, the question of efficiency. So food is water, is sunlight, is energy. A lot of energy goes into it. It takes a lot of energy to make fertilizer. Um, and it takes a lot of water. So, one of the things you can do with satellite imagery is optimize that. We call it precision farming, although precision farming is a, a trade name used by a big tractor company. Nonetheless, the generic term precision farming means figuring out where in your fields you should be planting and where in the fields at what time you should mm -hmm. be watering. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example. Now, if I go to the, um, to the less developed world, some of the things that people have done um, historically is predict famines. Those are usually things that didn't happen overnight. Um, the Syrian unrest, by the way, connecting with real life I want to understand issues. that. You told me about it last night. Can you just elaborate a little bit on it? Well, many people see the Syrian conflict as really a political uh, uh, clash of warring uh, interests mm -hmm. politically. But in fact, the chaos in Syria started with the longest drought in recorded history. Mm. Now clearly, in prehistoric times, there were probably droughts as well. But this is the first really long modern drought. 
it literally, in 2011, by 2012, it had reduced somewhere between two and three million people to abject poverty. Their cattle died. Their lands turned into dust. Mm. They came to the cities. And this is where the protests started. They were protests about you know, too many people in too small a space with not enough jobs and not enough food. And it ballooned from there. So it's a crisis of food. It was underlying it, a yeah. crisis of food. Now, Syria used to be a wheat grower, you know, yeah. and an yeah. exporter. It's now importing. How long can that continue? The whole country. Now, the worse it gets, there's a downward spiral for agriculture. That kind of war ends up mining fields. So it lays waste. The Romans did that, by the way, around Carthage. But today, it's landmines. It's, it's So that land is ruined forever. It, it is ruined until you are cleared of right. all of the stuff that, that, that war deposits on. Yes. Right. You know, so, today I learned that number of farmers in U.S. have gone down to something like 700,000. I was surprised that 700,000 people not only feed 300 million, but also produce a lot more food for export. That, that's so a, what's happening to the food industry that's, that, that's and food a, producers? That's a great, a great opening to go a little bit about how we got there. Yeah. Okay, so today, less than 1% of our population is, in, is even involved in food production. And a couple of centuries ago, half of us right. lived on farms. Right. And three centuries ago, Thomas Malthus was telling us that we were forever doomed to famine because our population grew faster than we could expand our food supply. So there were a billion people on the face of the earth when he wrote that. And that was in about 1800. Mm -hmm. Okay, Fast forward three centuries, our population has grown from one to seven billion, and the number, the fraction of us that are hungry went from half of us to, mm -hmm. to about six percent. Okay, That's remarkable. How did we get there? Well, there are three basic innovations. Mm -hmm. One was synthetic fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Fertilizer that comes, that's made in factories because mm -hmm. there's only so much nutrients mm -hmm. in the traditional um, fertilizers, Nature, yeah. which is manure and, mm -hmm. and other biological mm -hmm. uh, products. Um, but the second, so we could not have gotten from one to seven vineyard without artificial fertilizer. The second is machines, okay? Now we have, just look at the size of the machines that do everything from planting to cultivation to, to care of the mm -hmm. plants, spraying, mm -hmm. pesticides, to harvesting. So that's all it's technology. remarkable. Mm -hmm. So farms have gotten bigger and bigger. People go to the cities. This causes some, some social sure, problems, sure, sure. okay? On the other hand, it's extremely efficient. Mm -hmm. The amount of land that we farm hasn't changed in more than half a century. Mm -hmm. And yet the food supply has continued to grow and grow and grow. And that's because of both of those factors and a third one, and that's genetics. And genetics is critical in improving the productivity of the crop plants that we have. But, but there's a lot of debate globally on genetically modified food. Yes. I know in India there was a huge, you know, commotion and, you know, you worry about a lot of these discussions. Um, many of us spend a lot of time worrying about it. Mm -hmm. And here's the reality. This, and by the way, this very efficient farming that I'm talking about has gotten a bad label, mm -hmm. uh, factory farming. So factory farming and GMOs are completely vilified. My view is that that's a little bit of an unforeseen consequence of our very agricultural success. Mm -hmm. That is, most of us live in cities now. What mm -hmm. do we know about what it takes to grow food? Right. So there's all this, oh, let's go organic. But if the whole world went organic tomorrow, we could support maybe half of our current population. Mm -hmm. And who's going to line up to be the other half? Mm -hmm. Okay. It'll be more poor people, more starving people. That makes no sense to me. So 
What we need, and so let me go back to the GMO issue. Mm. People think that we never used genetics or modified plants or animals in the laboratory, but all of civilization is built on genetically modifying wild organisms. Yep. A wolf to a dog, um, the, the progenitor of corn is called teosinti and it has seeds, a few of them, hard as rock. They have silica deposits on them. People did that. We call it domestication, but domestication is nothing but genetic modification. Mm -hmm. The difference between then and now, and by the way, in the 20th century, although people don't really understand that because it's already familiar, we used chemicals to make genetic changes. Yeah, fertilizer is a good example. Mm, no? Fertilizer is to grow. Right. But to, to get into the genome and the genetics, I see. you can use chemicals, butagens, mm -hmm. and um, irradiation, so gamma rays, x-rays. But is that harmful to health? No, it's not. Okay. What happens is that for example, your ruby red grapefruit, everybody loves, very mm -hmm. healthful, very red. Mm -hmm. That was created by sending little shoots of grapefruit to the Brookhaven National Laboratories where it was irradiated and sending them back to Texas and then they planted them and looked for things that were interesting. And one of the interesting things they found was a, was a grapefruit that produced a lot more lycopene, which is that lovely red color that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. healthful substance. Mm -hmm. The difference between that is like using X-rays or a chemical mutagen is like taking a shotgun, um, mm. a pellet gun, to the genome and saying, tup, 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 making lots of changes and hope that one of them pops up well, and then you plant it in the field and say, look for things that are good, because most genetic changes harm the organism. The difference between that mid-20th century and now is that we've learned about genes, we've sequenced genomes, we know more in the time that I've been in science, we've learned more about the biochemistry, the underlying biochemistry and, and so forth, and molecular biology of how plants work than in all of previous history. It's mm -hmm. just been amazing. So today we, we can do things like simply add one G. Mm. And it, to me, it's a tragedy that now that we can do things very specifically, go in and change a, just one gene in a way we want to change it that will change its function in a way that is desirable. It's just at this juncture that somehow this concept has come to be very alien in our society. So all the previous kinds of genetic changes and techniques are considered conventional. So why are these people against genetically modified food? And who are these people? Um, there are two kinds of groups. One is um, the green pieces and friends of the earth of the world. Um, they have come out very strongly against GMOs. They've changed their stance on the nuclear issue, but not on GMOs. And Patrick Moore, who started uh, mm -hmm. Greenpeace, has simply said, guys, this is about my, my making money. It's not about the issues or the truth of the issues. Mm. And the author industry that has capitalized tremendously on vilifying GMOs is the organic food industry. Organic food is more expensive because it's an old-fashioned, inefficient farming system. Yeah, but, but it doesn't order, have better food value. Absolutely not. There's, yeah. there's studies that over 50 years that show it's exactly the same. And candidly, a plant doesn't care whether it gets its nitrogen from a bag of nitrogen fertilizer or cow poop. But you should, because cows and we share an evolutionary history. And but what about in pathogens. food packaging? But what yeah. about in food packaging, chemicals and all? Is that is, a health is, issue? A health issue in food packaging? Can you be more specific? You know, people say if you buy packaged food as opposed to eating I think, fresh. I, I think you mean processed, Processed right? food, okay. sorry, yeah. sorry. Process, the, the food processing industry 
has capitalized on our evolutionary desires. Mm -hmm. We evolved in an in a environment that was poor in salt, mm -hmm. and of course everybody needs some salt, mm -hmm. um, fat, mm -hmm. and sweet stuff. So we crave all of those things. Mm -hmm. And by God, if you look at most of the packaged stuff, sure. the processed stuff, it's very high in all of those things. They've gotten very, very good at optimizing a food so you'll reach for another one and another. Think about eating mm -hmm. potato chips. You don't just eat a potato chip. Mm -hmm. right? But that's us. And, and that's, again, it's something that stuck with us because it's in our biology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even as we change our lifestyle to a much more sedentary lifestyle, we're not running away from animals anymore. We're not hunting. We're not working from dawn to, to sundown for doing hard physical sure, work. Sure. So we have an epidemic of obesity. But um, those things are, are very difficult to reverse just because it's caught us in the things that we crave. Going back to number of farmers, which intrigues me, what do you think will be the future of farming? Are we going to see less and less farmers? Are we going to see smaller farms? You know, take for example in India, large number of people still live in rural areas. Of course, number of people coming to urban keep on increasing. What happens to all this rural population? Where is their livelihood going to come from? That, that's a big challenge, and, yeah. and, and you know half of the answer. People leave the land and go to cities. Right. And part of the paradox, both in, in India and, and in Africa, is that people have many children and then they subdivide their land right. until it's, they put a little fence around a little piece of land this that's big. That's right, and then... Who's going to land? Yeah. Many people hold land. There are many groups that, or individuals, who are actually acquiring land. Because to get out of that paradox, you have to create a system <coughs> that gives you more yield for the area. Subsistence farming is stuck. You need all of the three ingredients that, that I mentioned, which is the fertilizer, the technology. But that's very scale sensitive. Even a small tractor, mm -hmm. you're not going to use on a plot of land that's a hectare. Sure, sure. Right? Can't afford it. Now, will, will that happen? I think it's happening. Will it happen fast enough? And that I cannot answer. Because, to go back to what you started with, um, most policymakers live in cities and have a big paycheck. Um, they're very, very much out of touch mm -hmm. with what happens at that level. Now, in developed countries, particularly in the U.S. and South America and Canada as well, that role has been taken over by large companies mm -hmm. or mega farms. Mm -hmm. But the curious thing about mega farms is, again, the city dwellers vilify them. Factory farming, read My Michael Pollan or yeah, some yeah. of these New York Vertical people. farming, people talk about vertical farming. Vertical farming is terrific, hmm. okay? Except that you need light, right? Mm -hmm. In vertical farming, you either have to provide light, which is energy, or you have to, some of the gadgets I've seen, have a conveyor belt that takes it up to the top for enough time to... So you need to, more energy. But you're never going to go with your grain under glass. Hmm. Um, greenhouses... You can grow fruits and vegetables. Greenhouses and rooftop greenhouses. My daughter and her husband actually run the biggest rooftop greenhouse, which is called Lufa Farms in Montreal. Mm -hmm. They feed a lot of people. They harvest in the morning and people get their fresh produce year-round mm -hmm. by the end of the day. Wonderful, high-tech, Greenhouses. But isn't there but a need for isn't there a need for people to begin to produce their fruits and vegetables locally as opposed to bringing it from thousand miles away? That's been analyzed in great detail. That's very popular right now. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the economics of it, and let mm -hmm. let me just give you one example, it actually costs less to bring apples 
from the southern hemisphere by ship <coughs> or even by plane than, for example, to keep them in cold storage and in good shape to sell and, and watch it decay huh. over the winter. So the, there are many things that we can incorporate from local sources. Local farmers markets are wonderful in the summer, although it's a difficult way for farmers to, to make a living. But it will not it will not support a population of 10 billion. Mm -hmm. And the costs of the efficiency of getting things from where they're actually in season to where they're not in season is sufficient to keep that all going. So I think that the overemphasis on locally grown, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're very strict about it, <coughs> you need stored potatoes and stored apples and parsnips and other root vegetables through the winter, right? What is the role of uh, regulator in all of this? Oh, regulators do many, many things. Let me start with the positive things. Mm -hmm. um, our Food and Drug Administration has, and our USDA as well, mm -hmm. has set up a system that gives us really the safest um, food supply that humans have ever had in their history. Mm. So that said, there are still problems. The, as you scale up your, your food system, and especially with, with organic, because organic, mm -hmm. which uses natural fertilizer, is a source of, of uh, bacterial illnesses. Mm. It's the major source. Um, now, that's the positive sign. So the regulators are always on food safety and they're always the, addressing the issues of child nutrition. They don't always get it right. If you go through the history of USDA dietary guidelines, they're all over. And the reason for that is very simple. It's very hard to do controlled studies on food for 20 years on people. People lie, they cheat, they eat what they want. So um, real nutrition studies are pretty tough to do. But regulators regulate, and they don't often do a cost-benefit analysis. So for example, GMOs, when they first came on the scene, that's already back in the late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm one of the innovators. Mm -hmm. um, there was reason to be a little cautious, although there was no reason, there, we couldn't even back then identify any specific <coughs> damage arising from using these new techniques. Fast forward 30 years and we're still living under that same regulatory apparatus and it takes literally if, if you produce a new variety by a different method like radiation mutagenesis, you don't have to be regulated at all. You get right out on the market. If you genetically modify it by the new, very precise techniques, mm. it can take you two to 20 years. Like the genetically right? modified salmon has been in regulatory re-examination, re-examination for 20 years. And it's finally- Why is that? Because the society's view of GMOs has gotten very negative, mm -hmm. politicians get a lot of email, a lot of communications, don't you dare approve this. Mm. In fact, the, the GM salmon was held up for a long time, right straight from the White House. It passed its regulatory. So where is it now? Time. It's been approved. Okay. After, after 20 all, years. After 20 years. Wow. It, it is exactly the same. And what does it do? It okay. increases production? No, no, what it does is wild salmon grow and then they stop growing and then they grow, depending on the season. Mm -hmm. Okay, This fish is exactly the same except they've added a promoter, a, 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 a regulatory sequence in a, in a growth hormone gene that allows it to grow year-round. So if this is the final size, takes two years 
to, to obtain this size for a conventional salmon in one year <coughs> for the genetically modified salmon. So what that means is that that salmon can be produced closer to market economically in closed um, aquaculture facilities that actually deal with the waste. Because open cage farming in the sea is very polluting. Mm -hmm. So it's a real step forward. And you can, you can combine these facilities with the vertical farming that you described yeah, yeah, yeah. because the water that comes from the fish, it has nutrients in it that are perfect for plants. You have to adjust it a little bit. That's called aquaponics. Combine horticulture, mm -hmm. mostly for lettuces and so forth, and herbs, and the aquaculture. Interesting. It, it's, and that is very appropriate to set up in old buildings, in, in, yeah. you know, in, in uh, run-down areas, sure. abandoned warehouses, and so forth. Sure. And there's, that's what's happening. Uh, one, one interesting, interesting question I have had in my mind for a long time, with all the advances in technology, especially genetics, fertilizers, and others, do we see a day where cost of food is going to be almost insignificant? Um, that day is today. If you look at how much food costs as a fraction of people's incomes, mm -hmm. the growing technology-based mm -hmm. incomes mm -hmm. and the decreasing cost of food has put it, it's, it's pretty. What fraction of your income do you, do you spend on food? I have no idea. <laughs> but, because I eat out a lot, but I think I, I'm, I'm a wrong example. I'm really talking about most people, people in poor countries. That's a completely different issue. Oh, yeah. I, I would like to see a day when they don't have to spend more than 10% of their cost on food. Okay, but that revolution has started in India because right. you have technology-based wealth. Right. You have people coming to cities. Now, will India help the rural <coughs> agricultural areas transform to more efficient procedures? I don't know that. But what you're My saying is technology is here to do that. Absolutely. Okay, that's absolutely pretty, you know, promising. <coughs> it, it is so sophisticated that farmers can take care of their fields, plow them, plant them, water them, totally. From. So, what is the number in this country? How much of our cost we spend on food? I think it's less than ten percent. Less than ten percent. I don't have the precise figure. In my my mind, but but it's tiny. So when food costs, produce costs double, it barely registers okay. for us. Yeah. But there's a beautiful graph that shows the the Food and Agriculture Organization mm -hmm. of the UN keeps track of food prices, mm -hmm. and they show they, they generate a food price index. And in 2008, during the financial crisis, it peaked. Mm -hmm. Then it came down. Mm -hmm. Then it started climbing again. This was partly driven by that mm -hmm. <coughs> Syrian drought, but droughts weather across the globe. Mm -hmm. And they, this particular study that I'm referring to tracked when riots broke, up, broke, broke out. The Arab Spring started with food riots. Poor people protesting the rise in food prices. Mm -hmm. Then it comes down and then it goes up again. Now, Will it ever come down again? Not unless people come to terms with the need to make agriculture where it can be done more efficient. And there we're up against climate change. Because the warmer it is, the more severe weather, and the less efficient, um, the, it can actually impact the yields of corn, for example and heat it at just the wrong time can, can wipe out the entire. Can we ever eliminate hunger from this world? We certainly can. The question is, will we? So what prevents us from doing that? A thousand things. Attitudes. Um, the U.S. has been very um, active 
in aid and in agricultural development, particularly in Africa and India. I, and there have been revolutions. The Green Revolution is an yeah, example. Yeah, of course, of course. Okay? That was one man's work. Yep. And it can make a huge difference. But today, because of the anti-GMO attitudes, there are many, many NGOs that are telling the farmers, and your, your uh, colleague Vandana Shiva uh, goes around and tells everybody that the old ways were better and that this is poisoning the world and so forth. Boy, there's money to be made in being anti-GMO, but much less money to be made in it being pro-GMO and trying to get through this regulatory system. Hmm. So, will we get there? I really don't know. <coughs> so, from your perspective, what are the real challenges going forward? I think the most profound challenge um, is people, is people's attitudes, hmm. because change doesn't happen when people are not open to it. And that's just the bottom line. People have to open their minds to change, and they also have to embrace the people that are fleeing the environmental disasters that are happening, and will continue to happen increasingly because of climate change. That's a real challenge. How do you absorb the millions of people that are flooding into Europe? right now, fleeing starvation and persecution. So that, I think that's as big a challenge. The science is all there. There is no scientific impediment to feeding 10 billion people. That's great to know. This may be a good way to close, maybe. Yes. The challenge is our own attitudes and what we choose to do. Thank you, Nina. Thank you very much for sharing a lot of these great thoughts. Really appreciate your coming here and Thank I'm you. delighted that we had this chance. Good. Thank you.